this is something that we do here, and if you guys have been coming for a while, you know <clears throat> that my emphasis on this has shifted from guilt and shame and frustration and everything to a celebration. Not that Jesus died, but that he died and rose and accomplished our salvation. And Paul sums it up in 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And that's what we're doing. We're proclaiming it. We're saying, Hallelujah, thank you. This is what it's all about. This is when Jesus said, Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. It isn't cannibalism. It's sharing and thanking him, sharing with him in his plan of salvation. So let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for the bread which represents your body that was beaten and tortured and killed to take the punishment for what we have done and will do wrong. Where we fall short of the glory of God, you made that up. And then this cup that represents not animal blood, that covers sin, but your blood that forgives sin, totally gone, erases it. So the combination of the punishment paid and the forgiveness offered and, and accomplished is perfect, and that's what we're celebrating, the fact that we were lost and you saved us. So as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we are so grateful and thankful for it. Let's take it. Father God, we thank you for your plan of salvation and for your loving son who carried it out so faithfully and completely. We are totally, absolutely, and 100% saved. There's no guarantee on planet Earth like it, and we have it from you. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Father God, we lift up this men's retreat coming up next week, and we ask for you to work in the hearts of the men going, not just from our church, but from Calvary Treasure Valley, Calvary Chapel, Nampa, plus the people who don't go to church. I've heard there are people that aren't going, that are going to the retreat. I pray that they would have, in a good way, a come to Jesus meeting, <laughs> that they would meet him there, meet you there. And so we're excited about that. Pray for good results. We pray for Easter, Lord, as what you did accomplished salvation for anyone who calls on the name of the Lord there's someone else there that's on your miracle of you list, miracle of God, that you would use him to reach them so then he could come home. We also pray, Lord, as this comes to my mind, for Lori Kelly and the job situation, that you would provide one. We know that you can. We ask that you would. And we ask for you to bless your word. It will not return void as we look to it. Pray that it would touch our hearts. Some of these things we'll talk about today are pretty hard to deal with. But they're in your words, so we're going to go over them in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 6. Does anybody um, need a Bible and not have one? You can raise your hand. We'll bring one to you. We've got loners. Anybody want one, need one? Somebody want two or three of them? <laughs> you, take, you want one? Any? I said four. I know you said four. I heard that. Okay, Julie will be a sharer. Nice. See, they got somebody in church sharing the word right there besides me. Pretty cool. That's like a pun. I know, very punny, right? Man, if I kid around much more, I won't be able to get to the scripture. Okay, Luke chapter 6. This is what has been called by many people the Sermon on the Plain. You've heard the Sermon on the Mount. This is, I believe, a different message, a different time Jesus talked with very similar things, but also some things that are added that aren't in Matthew. So we'll pick it up in verse 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. 
And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful just as your Father also is merciful. So, he starts off, but I say to you who hear. This is one of the traits of Jesus I especially love. Nothing gets past this guy at all. He knew not everyone would be ready to hear what he had to say. But that doesn't take away from the truth of it or how important it is. So please, be one of those who hear. Because um, what is it that one TV show, hear me now and listen to me later. It's like, what <laughs> does that mean? No, hear me now and listen to me now is what Jesus is saying. The first word after that, love. There are four words in Greek for love. There's storge, which is family love, the bond among mothers, fathers, sisters, and brothers. I remember when I fell in love with my wife, and then eventually we got married, and when our first child was born, the difficulties of, for a woman to be pregnant and the fatigue and the way she doesn't like, the way her body is changing, and we husbands say, oh, you're glowing, you're beautiful. I'm not! You know, <laughs> so... <laughs> I kind of got frustrated at what was happening because of our son to her. But the instant he was born, it was just like this amazing bond that you just have with a child. And it's the same thing with the other two when they were born. So that's that storge, that family love. And then you have phileo, which is close friendship or brotherly love. We, that would be among friends. And we have a city that's named that. I don't know that they practice it a lot in Philadelphia, but it's called the city of brotherly love. It came from the word phileo. Then there's eros, which is where we get erotic, which is physical, sensual love between a husband and wife, which I will say right up here, standing up here, this is God created. It's between a man and a woman who are married to each other. <laughs> Not just, we're both married, so it's okay. No, 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 no. This would be married to each other then it's God created and it's a beautiful, wonderful thing. It's not bad. It's not evil. The world corrupts it. The devil corrupts it. Our flesh corrupts it, but God created it well. But this word love is none of those. It's agape, which is selfless, sacrificial, unconditional love, the highest of the four types of love in the Greek language. William Barclay, in his um, commentary on this section of Luke says, agape describes an active feeling of benevolence toward the other person. It means that, you ready for this? No matter what that person does to us, we will never allow ourselves to desire anything but his highest good. And we will deliberately and of set purpose go out of our way to be good and kind to him. This love toward our enemies is not only something of the heart. It is something of the will. It is something which, by the grace of Christ, we may will ourselves to do. So it's not just of the heart. The brain is involved, too. You make yourself, so to speak. You determine you're going to do it. But the heart ties in to where you want to. So it's both. This is the hardest type of love for us to accomplish because this is how God loves. God shows us every day how he loves, and because of his example, he calls us to that same level of love. Now, he knows we'll fall short, but we have to have that standard be perfection so we can always keep improving. If it's a certain level, you can get there. Whew. I've achieved 75% of the time I'm loving. Woohoo! I love those days off. I want to run into that guy. You know what I mean? No, we can't have that. you got to have that standard be perfection. So you continually, if you want to strive, strive toward being godly in your loving. But it's impossible for us to love that way. It's impossible. We have far too much of ourselves in the way to love like that. I 
personally cannot show selfless, sacrificial, unconditional love, the highest of the four types of love in the Greek language. And why? Because I'm selfish. Because I don't like to sacrifice, and I have conditions attached to the love I naturally feel. But this is where God comes in and saves the day. Because 1 John 4.19 says, We love him because he first loved us. Set the example. Now, you might say, oh, yeah? Well, how do I know God loves me? That's a reasonable question, and I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates, shows us by way of example, his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, you can say, okay, I understand. Sure. Jesus already died for my sins while I was before when I was a sinner because 2,000 years ago he did this. <laughs> of course he died for my sins before I knew him. Well, who wrote this? The Apostle Paul, who was alive when Jesus was alive before he died and was alive after Jesus accomplished this. So he's saying, while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. So it applies to Paul, it applies to us just the same. So there's no loophole there. You can't use that one. <laughs> Everything Jesus went through in his passion, which is his suffering and his death on the cross, was done because he loves you and you and you and you. <laughs> he did it because it should have been you on the cross. He did it because it should have been me taking the beatings. It should have been us who died that horrible death. But because Jesus loves you so much, he went through all that in your place. The only way we can really love our brothers and sisters is after we get an understanding that we are loved by God. It's a tremendous revelation, and it enables you to love others when you realize you are loved because it's hard to be loving when you aren't felt loved. Right? You ever notice someone who's kind of cranky and then maybe, or just kind of has a cranky personality, but maybe they fall in love and all of a sudden they're kind of more loving because the person they fall in love with tells them over and over they're loved? It even happens with rescued animals. They can be afraid of people. They can be bitter. They can be kind of cranky and, and snippy. But if you show them enough love, they can turn around and become very loyal companions, very wonderful animals. And that's a dog I'm talking about. How much more can a person respond that way? Okay, when you have a great understanding of the fact that you are loved by God. Did I say that? You are loved by God. And that understanding that we are loved by God leads us to love him. Back. 1 John 4.19 says, I said already, we love him because he first loved us. And once we realize he loves us, then we love him. And then the next logical step is he fills us with that agape love, that selfless love, that unconditional love. Then we begin to love our brothers and sisters properly and then extend that toward those outside the church family. Now, going on, picking up the rest of verse 27 and through the rest, most of the, pack, the passage here, Jesus gives us some of his most radical teachings because the first thing that comes out of his mouth after the word love is love your enemies. Now, we just talked about love and how it's important to realize you're loved by God so you can share this agape love. What does Jesus mean by enemies? Well, enemies is defined as the person to whom one is hostile. So, if I'm hostile to the person that's imaginary in that chair, I'm that person's enemy. I'm the one, right? Wait a minute. The person to whom one is hostile. So I, that one is actually my enemy. You see how that works? I'm the one hostile to them to whom I'm hostile, so that person would be my enemy because I've determined that. That's why I'm hostile toward them. It's important to understand that. It's a fascinating definition because the, the enemy is defined as the one who's the object of the hostility. Is that right? The person to whom one is hostile. I'm hostile to them. They're the enemy. Yeah. But this is not talking about your friend. This is not your brother or sister in Christ either. That doesn't mean you aren't expected to love your brothers or sisters in Christ. You are. That's a given. And unfortunately, some of us have made enemies of our fellow Christians, and I would say shame on us that that happens, and it does. 
But in context here, Jesus has been talking about how Christians will be treated by the world. The world is not planet Earth. The world is the entire collection of non-believers, or as we like to say, what? Pre-Christians. Remember, as Christians, earlier in this passage, Jesus said, we'll be poor, hungry, weeping, hated, excluded, and reviled by the world. That would make those in the world a natural enemy. By our definition, we are the object of their, um, the, the world is hostile to us, right? So the one, the person to whom one is hostile, anyway, they'd be our enemies. It's important to understand the person to whom I'm hostile would be my enemy. Okay, I've said it 19 times, probably 17 different ways, but uh, that, that one right there was right. So going on. Do good to those who hate you. Notice Jesus doesn't say this. Get back at those who hate you. <laughs> we don't have to be told that. That's what we naturally do. Someone shoves you, you shove them back, right? He even covered it in the Old Testament. Oh, you want to get revenge? You want to get even? Okay, you take an eye. he took your eye, you can take his eye. He took your tooth, you can take a tooth. Hand for hand, foot for foot, all these things he laid out. Because he knows our vengeance is, he took my eye, I'm taking his arm and his leg. And then I'll be even. If someone shoves you when you're in school, you push back, right? Maybe you get the friend to crawl on his hands and knees behind him and you, you push him and he trips over him. All these horrible things that happen. We don't get even. We get beyond even. And then we say, now we're even because we got the upper hand. God knows this. So he says, no, do good to those. In fact, Jesus doesn't even say, just leave those who hate you alone. Just ignore them. Like the sign in the dentist's office, ignore your teeth and they'll go away. You know, just send them away. But no, he goes much farther than that. He says, do good to those who hate you. This is demanding action on our part that will most likely not get a positive response from those who hate us. But he says, do it, act on it, do good things to those who hate you. It's not easy to do that. Sometimes it's hard enough to do good things to people who are good to you, let alone those who hate you. But they'll know we are Christians by our love, Jesus said. Number two, in verse 28, bless those who curse you. Now, to curse means to pray against, to wish evil against a person or a thing. My question is, who are these people who are not Christians praying to? To put, you know, a curse on, because the cursing is to pray against them. I don't know. But anyway, they are praying curses on us. We are to pronounce blessings on them, to wish them well, to ask God to bless them, and not just when they sneeze, Okay. Number three, and pray for those who spitefully use you. This means they accuse us falsely. It's hard not to stand up for ourselves. They accuse us of doing things we never did, or they accuse us of not doing things we should have or we did. We are to pray for them. Last week, I was sharing, if you were here, you know I was talking about Ted, the guy at work, who came up to me after Wayne was kind of picking on me about being a Jesus freak. And Ted said, you notice I didn't join in on that? And I said, yeah. And then he told me later that he got saved years later. Well, while we were walking, I forgot about this. We were walking in the building on the rest, way to lunchroom. And I looked at him and I said, no, I I'm not upset with Wayne. I pray for Wayne every day. And Ted says, what, that he gets hit by a truck? <laughs> I said, no, not that kind of prayer. What are you talking about? No. No, I pray for him to, you know, to get saved. And eventually, of course, that had an effect on Ted, and he got saved by somebody else that, oh, by God, but someone else led him to the Lord. But things are planning. We can't pray that they get hit by trucks. Pray that they would see Jesus. Because if they really met him in a very powerful way, in a real way, they'd stop being the way they are that irritates you anyway. Isn't that the best way to get them to stop? Then they're in the kingdom. Got to do a remodel on heaven. Need more room. Okay, number four, number verse 29. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. Hmm, this one is often misunderstood. Some believe it means Christians are not to retaliate in any instance, not to respond other than to turn the other cheek. Some people take it so far as to say we should demilitarize our nation. Shouldn't have any kind of defense like that, no military. It's not what Jesus is saying here. Remember, the whole chapter, he's been talking about interpersonal relationships, one-on-one -on -one, or a small group dynamic, nothing larger than that. Culturally, a slap on the cheek is more of an attack on honor 
than a physical assault. He's saying if someone hits you as an insult, especially based on your faith, such as a slap in the face, offer the other cheek. Jesus isn't prohibiting defense. He's prohibiting retaliation. See what I'm saying? If I were to come home, someone had broken in our house and was assaulting my wife sexually, physically, I'm not going to say, well, it's what he does. You know, I don't, I, you want to hit me too? Are you kidding me? What kind of a husband would I be? If I couldn't get to our guns, which I'll just tell you I have some, um, and a permit to carry them if I want, but uh, I would grab a lamp, I would grab a stick, I would make two fists, and I would die in the process if I had to to stop him. That's not what Jesus is talking about here, okay? But to, to do this, to allow someone, when they slap you, to take the, hit the other, turn the other cheek, it would take a tremendous reliance on the Holy Spirit. But if you draw on his power properly, the results are supernatural. And we're not talking, you know, ghost under, shh, shh, you hear that? It's not supernatural like that. It's beyond the natural capabilities we have as people. We get smacked in the face. If you've ever had it happen, you don't like it and don't want it to happen again. But he says, don't retaliate. In that instance, if you're, for example, if you're being slapped because, you know, denied Jesus, no, whack. That's, that's a type, I think he's more talking about that. F.B. Meyer says this, love like this is unbeatable. The world can usually conquer the man who fights back. It is used to jungle warfare and to the principle of retaliation, but it does not know how to deal with the person who repays every wrong with the kindness. It is utterly confused and disorganized by such otherworldly behavior. I used to work on an oil rig, and I'll just tell this story short in a short version because I've told it before. And my boss wasn't there, so the next guy in line was in charge that day. And he gave me a task to do, and I came back, and there was a guy from Chevron USA who just didn't like me. And I think it was a spiritual dynamic, honestly. And before I could say anything to the boss, the Chevron bot guy, who has no authority over me, really, directly anyway, started berating me and using words that the paint was peeling off the equipment nearby. It was amazing. He was just, my hair, my hard hat was almost blowing off, and I was like, wow. And God took my tongue, tied it in a knot, and shoved it down my throat to about my right knee so I couldn't retaliate. I'm just like, whoa. And finally, he ran out of stuff to say and stood there just breathing heavily. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but I just came to see John because he gave me this to do, and I finished it, and now I'm here to ask him what he wants me to do next. And that guy was stunned. He didn't know what to do because I didn't lash out. Because God didn't let me. He untied my tongue, brought it up from my knee just enough to say that and then put it back in my mouth. And John, who's the third party, is like, whoa, this is a trip. Um, <laughs> why don't you just go do that? I said, okay. Well, you know what's amazing? That totally released all the anger and frustration Rick had toward me. And we got along okay from that point on. And it's not me. Because I would have put up some kind of a defense, but I didn't. It's just a Holy Spirit response, and it worked. He was utterly confused and disorganized by such otherworldly behavior. It wasn't this guy is such a weakling. He was like, okay, there's some, actually what I'm seeing is some kind of a strength that he has that he can take that and not retaliate. Anyway, now the fifth one. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. This is another situation, as all of them are, where Jesus is dealing with our hearts. It's possible to be outwardly forgiving without showing real love. And that's what we need to do in these situations. Herschel H. Hobbes says in his commentary, this situation actually involves more like an armed robbery where they take your coat. The cloak is the outer garment and the tunic is the inner garment, such as what we would call a shirt. So Jesus says, respond in love. Put yourself in that guy's position. Why is he to the point where he's robbing you of your clothing? Okay, maybe he really needs it. He's telling us to respond in love by basically giving him the shirt off our back as well. It's such revolutionary stuff. Now, it says in Proverbs, it talks about the man who commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. And I'll tell you that when the husband gets home, it also says in that same section, if you're stealing from him because you're hungry, people will understand that. You're stealing to, to eat, we, we get it. 
and you may have to pay back more, but it'll get settled. But a man who sleeps with another man's wife lacks understanding. And it says in one section that he thinks it's all right, and then he didn't know until an arrow pierced his liver. That doesn't sound good. That's, that's, that's retaliation. The husband, the fury, okay? So it's what he's saying. So understanding, he's just taking my coat. Maybe he needs a shirt too. We're thinking and responding in love. This is active. Our coat is taken. We offer the shirt as a bonus. In this way, we are not showing anger, but showing love. There's an old saying that says, always forgive your enemies. Nothing infuriates them more but to forgive them. The sixth one, verse 30, give to everyone who asks of you. This is talking about everyone who asks of you. Why? Everyone? Because Jesus doesn't want us to discriminate. He wants us to love all people the same. So again, what is our guideline? How do we respond? What do we use for our barometer? How do we know um, how far we are to go with this? Give to everyone who asks of you. How far do you go? Well, love is the topic and love is our guide. If it's loving to give when they ask of you, then give without hesitation or even regard for what the possession is, whether it's cash, TV, lawnmower, whatever. If you need it, take it. But if it is not loving to give, then don't give it, no matter what it is or who is asking. I'll give you an example. When I used to go to Calvary Chapel, Boise, we had a big window van with multiple seats in it, rows of seats and, you know, two um, bucket seats in the front. Very f odd full-size van with a floor shifter. I mean, standard transmission. It was kind of fun. We called it the Bentmobile because our family and kids would pack friends in it and we'd go all over. And there was a guy at the church that lived at the Mission downtown, Boise, and he asked if he could get a ride home. And I said, sure, we can do that. And I talked with Chris. We've got time. Yeah, okay, good. Randy Nurmi, his assisting pastor at the church at the time, took me aside and said, now, Chris, I've dealt with this guy a lot. Giving him a ride home is a great thing. You need, you know, if you want to do that and can, that's fine. But if he asks you for money, don't give it to him because all he's going to do is go out and buy dope. Don't, don't facilitate that. I know this guy. Randy worked with people, pure word, the whole thing for a long period of time. So I trusted Randy. So we're driving and we're just talking and I know that I've got 20 or 30 bucks in my pocket and I know that my kids know that too and they're old enough to know that and to be able to talk on their own, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I know, it's setting up for a really ugly situation, isn't it? <laughs> so we're almost to the mission and the guy says, so um, can I borrow some money from you? And I looked at him and I said, Holy Spirit answer, I don't have any money I can give you. See how that's worded? I don't have any money that I can give you. Now I'm just praying, Lord, that's all I want to say. Please keep my kids from saying anything. What do you mean, Dad? We know when you went to the Albertsons this morning, you got 20 or 30 bucks. We saw the cash extra and you put it in your pocket and you hadn't spent it yet. We know you got it. What are you doing? Why don't you give it to this poor guy? He needs a ride home. He lives in the mission. What's wrong with you? I thought you loved Jesus. <laughs> you know? <laughs> None of that. They didn't say a peep. So I dropped him off. And, you know, he was all right. Did you have money? No. Well, okay. You know, so that told me he wasn't ter terribly desperate for it, for a real need, you know. And so dropped him off, drove away, and I said, now you guys know that I had money in my pocket. He said, yeah, Dad, we were kind of wondering what was going on. So I got to explain it to him. But praise the Lord, they were open enough to go, or angels were there. Nope, nope, not going to say a thing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you see, it was loving for me to not give at that time. So that's what the barometer is. Because we wouldn't have anything left in our possessions if, if we always gave everything away, unless we just did it with each other. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so Jesus says here, no matter who it is, if they ask, and it's loving, give to them. Number seven, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. This is even tougher because takes away means to take away from another what is his or what is committed to him to take by force. Sounds like stealing to me. This is real, hard teaching because we like our stuff. I like my stuff. I lock my car when I go into a convenience store, you know? I mean, I park out front and lock it, make sure I go around sometimes. I'm not sure the back door. Okay, good. I'm just going to be in there long enough to buy a soda, stand in line behind one guy buying a beer or whatever, and then I'm going to, he's buying the beer, not me. And then, <laughs> then I'm going to go back out and get my keys. Sometimes in convenience. Oh, that's right, I locked it. But I grew up in Southern California where if you went inside, because I, when I first moved here, pull up to 7-Eleven, that tells you how long ago because they don't even have them here in Boise anymore, I don't think. 
we found one, but I'd pull up and I'd get out and there's a car next to me with no one in it and the motor's running. And I'm like, that would not last where I grew up in Southern California. <laughs> well, it would. It would still be running, but someone else would be driving it away. <laughs> you know, you didn't leave stuff like that. You locked your doors. You locked your car. You took your keys. You maybe had somebody watch it for you with all that done. I lock my car when I park it out in front of the church during the week when I'm here working. I'm serious. I just do. There's an old saying, in God we trust. All others pay cash. It's the way we feel about people compared to God, right? But what is our guide? Love. If it is not loving to ask for our things back, we are not to ask for them. What was the motivation? Can you maybe find out why they were taken? In this way, we consider the other person even ahead of our possessions because there's a potential problem with possessions. Do we possess them or do they possess us? See the difference? In summary of these whole taking, giving situations of verses 29 and 30, David Guzik, one of my favorite commentators, says this. If we really lived this, wouldn't people walk all over us? Where would the limit be? The limit is easy to find. The limit is love. When fulfilling a person's request isn't loving toward them, then I shouldn't do it. Giving a person everything they ask for isn't necessarily loving. But it is all too rare that we come to the limit of love. Usually, we allow our own pride or lack of comfort or unwillingness to sacrifice to be our limit. And that, that is where the problem is. The eighth one, verse 31. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. I just love this. Jesus is so good at summing up his teachings. This is what we call the golden rule. There's a man, I'll give you a list of a few people. There's a man named Hillel. He's one of the great Jewish rabbis. There is Philo, the great Jew of Alexandria. There is um, Isocrates, the great Greek orator. Then there are the Stoics of ancient Greece and Confucius, you've heard of him, the Chinese philosopher. All these people had similar philosophies. They said the same basic thing, and this is what it was. Whatever you don't want done to yourself, don't do to others. Very simple example I use first service. If you don't want people to throw eggs at your house, and the cleanup you have, don't throw them at their house. Then you're being loving, right? I mean, that, that is true. That's not, it's in the negative. If you don't like done to yourself, don't do it to anyone else. It's not bad advice. It's kind of nice. It's a good way to live. But here Jesus is asking so much more. He is saying, if you have things you do like to have other people do to you, then you do them to others. The philosophy of the world says don't. The philosophy of Jesus says do. It's active. Now, it can take effort to not do something to someone else you would not want to have happen to you. But it takes far more effort to do something to someone else you would like to have done to you. But it shows the love of God to the world. For example, if you have a next-door neighbor or someone in your neighborhood, and their lives are so busy, maybe... Um, they have a son in the hospital. <laughs> Maybe they have a relative family matter. They're working three jobs, and he's the only one who's old enough and able to mow the lawn. You know what I mean? And so the house looks ragged, and it's not because he's lazy. It's because he's so overwhelmed. Would you, in that situation, like it if you came home and someone had mowed your lawn and you don't have to do it? Maybe it's 10 at night and you couldn't mow it because the neighbors would call the police, and you, wouldn't, you don't know what flowers you would have run over in the dark. You know what I mean? It's just doing, you see something and you act on it and you do it. You see, it's in the positive. We tend to think of the golden rule, don't beat me up and I won't beat you up. Well, how about if I'm nice to you just because I like it when nice things happen to me? Just because it's nice to do. It's good. That's the difference. Whatever you want men to, to do to you, you also do to them likewise. It's just a positive way of thinking about it. And then in 32 through 34, but if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. That's easy. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. Again, easy to do. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back, or I would say maybe even more with interest, right? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. These examples are easy for us. They're natural human behavior. Jesus calls us to that supernatural behavior. Not ghosts and goblins, but showing his agape love to a dying world. 
it's really refreshing because they're dying of thirst. They just don't know it. We need to show that to them. The contrast is in 35. But love your enemies. Do good and lend. Here we go. Ready? Hoping for nothing in return. I don't know if that's lending. That sounds like giving, (laughs) doesn't it? Hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Here Jesus tells us when we obey him in these things, our behavior is godly. Have you ever noticed that God is kind to the unthankful and evil? He really is. I mean, in general, they're still working, right? They have jobs. Is it only Christians who are employed in the world, in the whole planet? Or do a lot of people who aren't lovers of Jesus Christ employees and business owners? Of course they are. They have houses they, or an apartment or a, a condo or someplace they live. They eat pretty much every day, sometimes several times a day. They're still breathing. Oh, that's the bad guy who's breathing. And even though they do not thank him at all, in fact, they are evil to boot, right? Evil means in an ethical sense, evil, wicked, bad, ethically. How they do things, what their standards are, are evil. And God is still kind to them, and he's merciful. And kind means good, gracious, and kind. He is kind to them, and he knows all about them, and he's kind to them anyway. Even that they're unthankful and evil. So he calls us to be kind to them too. And he sums it up in 36. Therefore, be merciful, just as your father also is merciful. Our behavior must be just like God's toward our enemies. And the enemy is the one, right, that we have the the animosity toward. So first of all, if we don't have that animosity, they're not an enemy to begin with. We are their enemies maybe, but they are not ours. The only way we can do that, oh, wait a minute, merciful is defined as pitiful. And that doesn't mean like, uh, you, you, you're just pitiful. You're just the worst example. No, it's full of pity. You know what a gas gauge is? Empty? Most of ours are closer to empty nowadays, right? But if it's full, you have a pity gauge on you, and it's full. You are full of pity toward them, which means this. You're compassionate for the ills of others, of the character of God to be expressed in his people as tender mercy toward those others. Be that way. The only way we can do that is through the Holy Spirit. He can and he will direct us to this type of godly behavior. But just as I said earlier, agape means we choose to be a loving person. God is a loving God. We must choose in our hearts to be as much like him as possible. And then you'll be a good example of Jesus to the world. So let's pray. Father God, thank you for these great examples for telling us to love our enemies. Because when we figure out who our enemies are, they aren't our enemies if we're loving toward them because then we're not having the hostility toward them. It's incredible. That's how you could say, forgive them, but they don't know what they're doing. If they really knew that God is real and that God is alive and that you sent Jesus to die in our place, they wouldn't have done it because they'd be killing God. They would know it. They didn't know who you were. They didn't know what they were doing. So because of their ignorance, you had compassion. It's amazing because you are love. Thank you for loving us and instructing us this way, Lord. We need your enabling power. We need your Holy Spirit to do this because we fight against it all the time. Help us to want to be more like you and less like us every day. In Jesus' name, amen.